Hey there everybody, it's Nathan Cool, and in this episode I want to talk about light stands including not just my recommendations but what I look for in a light stand so you can also make some good buying decisions for your gear as well. Now over the years I've gone through a lot of light stands, a lot that I thought were great deals, they ended up being just junk and I had to pitch them. Some were too bulky, they really didn't fit what I needed to do, and some that really fit the bill for most of my work which is real estate photography and also doing portrait photography so some things like portability and whatnot that I need as I go forward but there are some issues no matter what light stand that you end up choosing nothing is ever perfect so finding that balance of price stability and all that I'm gonna cover that in fact I'm gonna cover three sections in this video the first is the things to look for when choosing a light stand and I know this may be simplified like well I just needed to mount my light but there is so much more to it you don't want the wrong type of light stand that you're going to spend just a little bit of money on and then it can cause a lot of damage while you're on site that you hopefully have insurance to cover. So that's going to be an important thing that I'll cover first on just things to look for in the light stand. Next I'm going to show the two here that I've narrowed down on and what I use them for and of course once again a lot of this is for real estate photography and portrait photography so things that I associate with that type of work with a particular light stand stand and also then why. Then I'm going to narrow in on the one that I use the most, the absolute most. It's the one that I recommend in my lighting guide also for real estate and why I choose that light stand and over others that might be out there. But along with that, if you've ever bought my lighting guide, you know, and you've bought some of these light stands, you may find some issues with them. So I've got some hacks that can help along the way, some things that just cost you a couple bucks, keep in your camera bag or in your lighting bag and then you can quickly fix any issues that you may have on site. Now to make sure if you want to check out any of this gear, anything that I talk about throughout the video, I have links in the description for this video for the light stands or the gear I'm going to talk about and also to my real estate photography series if you're interested in that and want to check that out. So without further ado, let's jump into the first part of this video which is the things that I'm looking for when I'm buying a light stand. So the first thing that I look for overall is how sturdy this stand is. Now I don't want to pay a thousand dollars for a light stand, five hundred dollars for a light stand, and I'll get to pricing in just a little bit because you can find some really good sturdy light stands for decent prices if you look for a couple things. One, they'll almost always say heavy duty. That's an important thing also, but along with that you want to make sure that it's air cushioned. So some light stands in their sections will have some type of spring-loaded mechanism. If they don't have any mechanism for safety at all, it's gone. There's no sense in doing that. So air cushion, what that means is there's a, it's a type of a piston inside of here that allows some air. Both of these light stands, by the way this is Manfrotto and this one's a Flashpoint. I'm going to get to details of those in the model numbers in just a second. Both of these though are air cushioned heavy duty light stands. So the air cushion, if you've never seen it, I'll just loosen this section here and when I go down on it you can hear that there's a, it's slow to go down, there's a little bit of air that's being released on it. If I were to release it just on its own, you can see that it slowly goes down, it doesn't just completely collapse. So if something were to go wrong on site, for instance if one of these knobs fails on you for some reason, it's not going to collapse, it's just going to slowly, slowly go down like that. So that's fine. And that's something that for all the knobs on here, you want to have all of your sections air cushioned. Now typically the bottom most section of these light stands will have the, the most air cushion safety and that's just simply because the bigger that column is when it's near the bottom the more air piston uh, capability that it has in it. So that's an important thing to look for making sure that it's air cushioned. Now will it be able to take the weight of what I'm looking for? Now both of these light stands are pretty much similar in that and I'll get to the specs to compare them. Here I just happen to load an 8200 on top of this light stand and an 8400 here, but both of these light stands could take an 8600. Now you know in previous videos I used to use the 8600 a lot, now it was before Godox came out with the 400 and then of course with the 200. Now I use these as kind of my primary lights along with speed lights. Once again a lot of details like that are in the lighting guide for when. But as far 
far as what they can hold, if you're taking a look at a 600, that's about seven pounds. This 400 is about five pounds. This 200 is about two pounds. And that is a, a good amount of weight to put on a light stand, even if it's rated at, let's say, 15 pounds, because you want to have a safety factor. Take your weight of your light and double it. So if you have a seven pound light, double that to 14 pounds and make sure that the stand can hold that as its limit. Stands will over time lose some of the air cushioning in their pistons, pieces will start to wear out over time. When you're doing photography full time and you're out on set, you're doing stuff like whether it's real estate um, through houses or you're doing uh, some type of portrait work, wherever you are on set and on site, little pieces will get a lot of turning a lot of moving, a lot of stuff that will eventually start wear and tear. Put a safety factor of two into your weight limit and then you'll have a much more sturdier, safer uh, light stand to then work with. And that's what I do with all the light stands that I've made a choice for, including these two that I'm gonna get into in more depth here shortly. The second thing is for the type of work I'm doing, I'm looking at height. Now, you might think, especially in real estate photography, you want something very, very tall, 12 feet tall, because you might do a ceiling bounce off of an 18 foot ceiling or a 12 foot ceiling. But really, once you get that high, then you're starting to have a diminishing point of return for doing anything with height when it comes to bouncing. And that point, you get into using modifiers, just like you would for portrait and other work, where you might use a shoot through umbrella. And by the way, I have a link also in the description for the video showing some examples of where I use the shoot through umbrella on this guy right here, the 8400. And you can apply that to the 8200 and others as well. And of course, bounce umbrellas if you're doing portrait photography or other stuff or soft boxes, but whatever that is, once you hit a certain limit of height, then you really get a point of diminishing return, especially if you want something dramatic, you want to have the light fairly close to the subject anyways, too far away, it's you know highly diffused. That's an artistic choice, but I found that if I buy a nine foot light stand and I extend it up to maybe eight foot maximum, that's all that I really need. Once I go above eight feet, I might just want to just put on a modifier at that point. There's no sense in me going up so high, even with a modifier or doing a ceiling bounce at something that's nine feet or 10 feet. Now, with that though, if you think about, well, I can get by with a seven foot stand or an eight foot stand. Once again, that safety factor comes in. So just like I was talking about with weight where you want to double the amount of uh, light weight so that you can figure out what the stand weight limit would be. The same here goes to a certain degree where you want to be able to never extend your light stand to its full capability because once again it'll work that way when you first get it but after shooting full time after about a year of wear and tear out in the field you don't want one of these columns to start getting wobbly and then start to fail on you whatever that is once again good reason to look for air cushion when it comes to your light stands so anyways i like to have a nine foot stand that i might extend to about eight feet that's usually about my maximum height so anyways that's what i'm looking for because if you do get also something that's higher than nine feet then you're looking at a harder to collapse light stand. And that's going to be very important for portability as you carry these in equipment bags and also as you carry stuff like this throughout the house. So I'm going to show you those footprints and how they compare here on these two stands in just a minute. But before then, there's another topic I really want to cover first before getting into that on what I look for in light stands. And of course, this last item before getting into the specs and a little bit more details is I want portability. So using C stands are, are great. I mean, that's a fantastic option. If you've got the money for it and you've got a full-time studio that you've got set up, whether it's at home or you've got a separate office for it. But realistically, that doesn't work for most photography today because most of us are very mobile. So especially real estate photography or even doing a portrait photography on site, I need to be able to fold these up, get them into a bag, and then move them along. So it, that also helps me portability-wise to get them into a set, onto a shoot. I don't want to keep running back to my car and pulling out a couple stands at a time. Most of the portable light stand bags, and I'll have a link to the one that I use in the description for this video, they max out at maybe three feet, about 36 inches. The one I use maxes out at about 35 inches. So that's a tough thing for portability. You need to have 
have something that will collapse small enough, still have a good footprint, still be able to reach that nine foot height, still be able to then be, as I mentioned, first off, air cushioned and something very sturdy. So that's quite a mix and that starts winnowing down our choices for light stands for doing most of the work and once again, what I would recommend. So let's start diving into that more. So now let's get into the light stands themselves. I wanted to zoom out here a ways so you can kind of see me manipulating these a little bit more. What these are is this one over here is the Manfrotto 1005BAC, and this one here is the Flashpoint Pro Air Cushioned 9 foot light stand. Both of these are 9 feet tall. So extending these light stands, it's fairly easy. It's always best if you can to, if you want the sturdiest ability, just like you would on your tripod when you're extending it up, always best to start with the sturdiest leg first. But when you're talking about nine feet, sometimes it's best if you know just about where you're going to be to start extending the top one, especially if you've got a lightweight light. This is just a, an 8200, like it's about a pound and a half, two pounds. But then you would start extending the other ones up as tall as you need to. So the bottom one is going to give you the sturdiest capability. And like I said before, you really don't want to max these out to the full nine feet. Usually about eight feet works fairly well. So that can uh, extend up fairly well. And it's a pretty good sturdy light stand. This has three sections where the Manfrotto has just two and they're definitely a sturdier column. You can see how thick they are in comparison to the Flashpoint light stand. And they extend up fairly nice too. And that can go up to the same height. So both of these will work just fine as far as the height is concerned. So when it comes to weight load capacity, that's an important factor. And like I talked about doubling that. So we have to factor in a fairly high number compared to our lights. The Manfrotto light stand, as you'd expect out of just about everything made from Manfrotto, that has a 22 pound load capacity. So that's a beast. That can carry a heavy light. If you were to double the weight load that you'd want from a, an 11 pound light, that would top out there. When of course the 8600 is only about seven pounds. So easy enough to handle that. That's where the Flashpoint has a little bit of a, a shortcoming, which is that its maximum load capacity is a little under 16 pounds. So if you have a seven pound light, that's 14 pounds, it's starting to reach the maximum weight load carrying capacity of this particular stand. Now, since the uh, Godox has come out with the 8400 and the 8200 over the years, it's very rare that I break out the 8600 when I'm doing a lot of the portability required work for light stands, which is mostly real estate photography. If I'm in a static situation where I'm in like a big warehouse or I'm shooting some portraits someplace where I've got a lot of room in some corporate center, then I've got more room for the Manfrotto to put an 8600 on and that's fine. But the load capacity is just fine, but it comes at a cost. So if you're to get the Manfrotto light stand, this 1005BAC light stand, the beast of a light stand for portability, it runs $130. Now, if you're going to be using two of those light stands, that's 260 bucks. Compared to if you buy the Flashpoint light stand, it runs about $40. So you can buy uh, three of these Flashpoint light stands for the price of one Manfrotto. But bear in mind how you're going to be using them. So yes, this one does have some shortcomings to it, but it has some huge advantages that I'm going to show also here in just a little bit. So price is a concern with that. And also, by the way, there's different ones of these. You see, this is blue. They also have uh, blue, they've got red, they've got regular black. And some of that's so you can identify the lights at a distance. You've got multiple lights set up. You can go, oh, the blue stand is associated with group B. The red one is associated with group A. And whatever it is that you've got your lights can figured for in your transmitter in the hot shoe of the camera, it can make it easy to identify. Also, it can make it easy to identify if you're in a competing situation. So if you're not the only photographer on site doing sports or something else like that, you know which one's yours, unless other photographers happen to choose the exact same light stand. So anyways, price-wise, definitely the uh, Flashpoint wins out. And that's one of the big reasons why I have this. And then I don't mind buying spares to have in my car or at home when I need to break those out. 
The next issue is to consider footprints. So I wanted to zoom down here and show the feet of this and show some advantages over each one of these. Now, the footprint, when you take a look at the Manfrotto, is a lot wider. We can see it's a much wider footprint. In fact, that maximum footprint is about 36 by 38 inches. When you take a look at the maximum footprint on the uh, Flashpoint stand over here, this one's only 24 to 27 inches. So it's a much smaller footprint, even when it's maxed out in size. Now, the minimum footprint is what's interesting. So the Manfrotto stand really can't collapse that much. It collapses to about a 24 by 27 inch uh, minimum uh, footprint, where the Flashpoint can go to a 14 by 14 inch. And the advantage of that is it comes from the ability for the light stand legs to be able to adjust up. So we're used to collapsing our light stands and we you know, put them away in a light stand bag like this. But with light stands like the Flashpoint, you can also keep going down. And when you do, you can collapse that into a very small footprint. Now, you don't have a lot of stability with something that small, so you have to be very careful. But there are situations when doing real estate photography, especially with, with a small light, where you can tuck this into someplace very carefully. So that comes in handy. By using the Manfrotto, it's a lot tougher. There's really no capability to do that. One of the advantages of the Manfrotto is that you can stack multiple uh, light stands together because these will collapse flat, and I'll show you that in a second. But its capability, trying to do that, just maxes out. So when you put it up, you would be putting it away like this. When you go down to its maximum, that's all you can do. That's as far as you're going to go with the Manfrotto. So that's why no matter what you do with the Manfrotto, it's going to have always a much wider footprint compared to then the Flashpoint, which will have a very much smaller, a much smaller uh, footprint when you can collapse it up like that. So the collapse length then, when we finally put these back into our bags, it's very important to understand the Manfrotto is much taller. So this comes in at about 39.4 inches when it's collapsed. You can see the flash point smaller at 33.5 inches. Now the flash point, typical, you've, it's a type of a round type of footprint when you put it away. This uh, Manfrotto 1005 BAC is interesting in that it collapses flat like this. So it's an interesting light stand and they did this so that you could stack a few of these together. So if you're going on site for a very large job and uh, you wanted some sturdy light stands and you wanted three of them together, you could stack those. I find that really not necessary. Um, it's kind of a unique feature that they have, but for me, it's just not worth it. But for the price, um, the size doesn't matter so much for a certain particular type of work that I would do. And once again, this type of light stand wouldn't necessarily be for portability for everyday jobs but when I need something really big, then I don't mind having it outside of one of my light bags and having this support a very large light, that's fine. But for most portability issues that I need to be able to fit into a light bag that's about 35 inches, maybe 36 inches maximum, then having this 33.5 inch height really does help. Now, something that can also help just to be aware of on either stand is that the spigot up at the top, the spigot, or we might call it a mount for your light stand those things do come out and they come out so that you can also mount them sideways for other type of gear. So it comes out on both light stands and that's so that you could put it in this direction, you know, to put something else going out the other direction. So if you did have a restriction that was just an inch or two on the light uh, bag that you have, the light stand bag, then you could uh, take the spigot out and then uh, put your light stand in there. So something to be aware of. Also, these things tend to be a little sharp. They come with a little rubber cap and you can keep those on. I usually don't worry about that. So I go through a few light bags a year because they do tend to scrape up things a bit. But this is one of the biggest important factors that if I'm going to have portability, I need the whole kit and caboodle. Yes, I need something that's going to fit into my light stand bag better than something that's much taller. I do need something that's going to be sturdy enough for the lights that I'm going to use. It's going to have enough stability. It's going to have then a small enough footprint. And once again, when it comes price wise, you know, this flash point over here, I can buy three of these for the price of just one man Frodo.
So although I highly recommend this uh, Flashpoint light stand, here's an older one and I'll show you some of the problems that it's had. You notice there's different hardware that's on here for some of the knobs. This is the original hardware where you'd turn it, you'd be able to adjust the height of your uh, that particular segment of the stand. But what happens is sometimes these things will wear out. Now that's because mostly it's a compression uh, type of fitting where it's got to have pressure on both sides. And so then what happens is eventually those will get stripped and sometimes the bolt in this will get stripped out. So what I've done, I have two different alternatives, hardware, I've got links to this also down in the description. One is that using uh, what's known as a ratchet knob, you can push in on the center button and put it to where you'd like, but then you can start turning this much easier. You've seen this probably on, on other lights where you can then tighten that and then that holds it in place. You don't like the position, then you just push in on that center uh, piece and then you can move that knob to where you want to so that it's out of the way. On the other side of that is then just another knob that holds that in place. So instead of using a nut and the reason for that is because of the second option. Let me zoom in real close and show you that. So the second option, it's a very simple, it's a smaller type of footprint for hardware. And what it does, it takes advantage of using just a bolt on one side over here that goes through to a knob on this other side over here. You can see this light stand's been had some, some better days over the years. So uh, on normal, this particular bolt, it would be about an M5, M6 or something like that for metric. It's harder to find in the United States. So I use a quarter uh, inch uh, bolt through here. And once again, links to all this in the description for the video, and it just rests outside of it. Let me go ahead and take this fully apart here so that you can see it and how this is assembled. So that knob just comes right out. I put a washer on it. Let's turn it just a little bit so you can see it. And there's a washer on there and then that quarter inch bolt uh, just goes right through there. This type of a knob allows you to screw right through that knob so you don't have to worry about it then sticking out and, and hitting you too far if you have the right type of bolt in there. These are very inexpensive parts to keep in your light bag and these tighten up fairly well. So I can lock that in place very well. I can loosen that up and start extending the segment if I need to and that'll work very well. But on the top here, there is a smaller column that needs to be compressed where on the bottom it was thicker. So if you have a problem with this or any other light stand that uses this type of compression setting uh, type of fitting, that you can use the first option that I showed that uses that ratchet knob, gives you a little bit more leverage on a knob like this for this size, it's a little bit uh, narrower, so it can be a little bit harder on your fingers, but it's basically about the same size as the regular knob. Take this down here, you compare the two sizes. This one is just to hold the spigot, but it's the exact same size that you would find um, for the uh, for the compression knob for that. So anyways, having a few of these in the bag uh, really does help having it in your lighting bag. And these light stands will last for many, many, many years, and they'll last longer too if you keep some of these parts on hand. It saves you while you're on site. The last thing you wanna do is be on site and have some type of equipment failure, and not just because of your light stand, but now you can't extend the section because you can't tighten the section. So having just a couple bucks worth of hardware in your light bag can really save the day. So besides these spare parts that you could keep on hand, it's very important that whenever you get a new light stand in, test it very thoroughly. It only takes about two minutes. And that's just making sure that if you have a section extended, that when you push on it, it's not gonna collapse. Now, you don't wanna force it. You know, if, if it's rated at, uh, this one is rated at 16 pounds, try to put about 16 pounds of force, put a light on it, see if it's gonna withstand. If any of the sections collapse at all, you have something extended, and all of a sudden you're pushing it, whoa, whoa, that's extending, that's, that's collapsing too easy, or you gotta put a ton of force on one of your knobs to lock it in, send it back. It's a bad light stand. And this happens a lot. Light stands are mass produced and they're not usually machined highly accurate either. So you will get sometimes little fittings that aren't quite right. And the same goes when we take a look at the bottom. So 
Let me just collapse this real quick and show you what I mean. So these are the sections. We want to make sure that every single one of these sections is very sturdy. But down here also, when we take a look at collapsing this light stand, if this moves at all after you've tightened that knob, send it back. It's a bad light stand. So all your hardware from top to bottom, check that out. Make sure that that's very sturdy. One other thing too I'd like to point out is that some people will complain that some of the legs on the light stand down here, they'll be using rivets. That that's typical. Rivets are used on the very bottom for the legs as a type of axle for each one of those leveler legs and also the supports between them. It doesn't require a lot of load, so that's very common. In the old days, there were, and some light stands still have, a small bolt that would go in there and you could replace those, but it's very uncommon. Even the Manfrotto, once again, has those rivets in there. Well, I hope this video was useful for you and that you can use some of this in your photography as well. If you did like this video and you want to see more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It won't cost anything. And as soon as one of these videos is posted, you'll be the first to know. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take care, be safe, and get out there and shoot something.